Well, brethren, I, I, in starting this, I want us to think about something. As we begin, in some ways, you know, we're beginning a, um, you know, this whole period of time between uh, the end of the Feast of uh, Tabernacles and the last great day and Passover, you know, is this, this, this big period of time that, especially here in Canada, we go through when the world starts getting darker by the days. We have to suffer put up with Halloween. We have to put up with some of the other things that are, that are not necessarily, uh, that are well, not necessarily, they're not God's feast days. Of course, there are some things that are in historical things, some things that uh, remind us of what God is doing, whether it is Purim or, or whether it's Hanukkah and seeing how God has delivered his people in times past. But I want us to look at something today, um, and I'm calling this sermon... Uh, because we're beginning a new year, and, and in some ways it's a bit of a challenge. And it's always a challenge after the feast. You come home, and first of all, you, you got a pile, you got bills to pay, right? Has anybody got bills to pay? You have stuff to catch up with, you've got work to get uh, going and catch up with where, you know, what's happening to everything that you left when you went to the feast to catch up with what's going on. It's a bit of a challenge, and we're looking at where are we going, at we've had this spiritual shot in the arm. We had all these messages, and you heard them. It wasn't just for entertainment. All the messages that you heard during the feast weren't there just to, you know, tickle your ears and to make you feel good for the moment. Okay, this is what, you know, we're, we're far beyond in the Church of God just uh, making us feel good for the moment and then moving along our, you know, sweet own way. We have a, there's a reason for all the messages, and... There are things that we're looking for. And I, the title of this sermon, I don't, don't normally tell you what my title of my sermon is, but I wanted to give this to you because it is where we are. And it's the handwriting on the wall. If you should turn with me to Daniel 5. Now, those of you who a week ago, Friday 8, as the French would say, or uh, previous Friday, I gave a of course, a, a special presentation talking about the historicity uh, of the Bible, how archaeology really comes back and forth, really supports the Bible, and the fact that it's just not made up. Now, this Daniel chapter 5, for the longest period of time during the um, 19th century, that's the 1800s, and even into the early part of the 20th century, a lot of people felt that this was just fiction. They felt that this chapter was just fiction because they said, well, there isn't, if we look at the king lists that are preserved elsewhere in antiquity, there isn't a Belshazzar. The last king of the Babylonians was Nabonidus, okay, before the Persians took over. So who's this Belshazzar guy? Well, as, it, as you would have heard in, if you'd been at that meeting, uh, actually it turns out that this, this whole thing of uh, Belshazzar is very much a historical person. That he was left in charge by his father while his father went off campaigning for about 10 years in Arabia to reassert the, that, port, that portion of the Babylonian Empire. And he was left in charge, but he was second in charge. So it turns out that uh, people are having to um, revisit this and take a look at this, that this was something that Belshazzar was a real historical person. And he was the one who was in charge when Babylon fell. Let's take a look, at, let's read here from chapter 1, and I'm going to read it in the New Revised Standard Version. King Belshazzar made a great festival for thousands of his lords, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. Under the influence of the wine, Belshazzar commanded that they bring in the vessels of gold and silver that his father, Nebuchadnezzar, actually his grandfather, because if you take it, his mother was probably one of Nebuchadnezzar's um, daughters, and taken out of the temple of Jerusalem so that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. This is one of those famous Babylonian orgies. <laughs> Where they'd get together and get plastered. Okay, and then do the things people do when they're fully drunk with a lot of women and whatever, you know. This is what was going on that evening. 
So they brought the vessels. So they're you going to drink their party vessels of what they're going to drink out of were the vessels from the house of the Lord that were taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar many years before. Nebuchadnezzar at this point in time had been dead for about 23 years. That, uh, that were taken out of the temple of the house of, the, of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubine, concubines, or as sometimes it, uh, the, the children will say his cucumbers, <coughs> drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Can you imagine you're taking something? We have a very hard concept to some degree of understanding what something that is holy is in our society because we don't have really holy things. You know, I don't have a holy microphone. You know, I don't have, we, there's not really a holy place in the sense that you have God's actual presence there. But these were things that were, at that time, were in the temple of God, who God's presence was there, and things connected with God, they were holy, and there were strict regulations of who could touch these things, who could use these things, because it, it was something that pertained to God. And you, when, when you have something that pertains to God, you show it respect, you show it honor. If you do not show it respect and you do not show it honor, well, oftentimes the penalty was death. We can also read about that in other in the scriptures because God isn't going to be mocked ever. Anyways, so there he was, Belshazzar, his wives and his concubines and all his lords were getting plastered and they were drinking out of the vessels taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem years before. Verse 5. Immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and began writing on the plaster of the wall of the royal palace next to the lampstand. So there was doing, because usually you had mud brick and they would plaster it and then they'd paint on it or whitewash it. And this was right by a lampstand, so it had illumination. You could see what was going on. And the king was watching the hand as it wrote. Then the king's face turned pale, and he thought, and his thoughts terrified him. His limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. The king cried aloud to the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the diviners. And the king said to the wise men of, Babylonia, of Babylon, Whoever can read the writing and tell me, and its interpretation will be clothed in purple, have a chain of gold around his neck, and rank third in the kingdom. Belshazzar was known in history as really a very somewhat impious and ruthless person. The way he conducted his affairs, the way he ran his kingdom, he was known as being impious and ruthless. And here was a man who saw something that was scaring the daylights out of him. And he was offering to clothe somebody in purple, showing a royal dignitary and putting a chain of gold around his neck, like a chain of office, just like you'd see the Lord High Mayor, or even the, the mayors here, even in Nanaimo, on their formal occasions. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or, uh, or tell the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar became greatly terrified, and his face turned pale, and his lords were perplexed. The queen mother, when she heard the discussion of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall. And the queen mother said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts terrify you or your face grow pale. There is a man in your kingdom who is endowed with the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, his grandfather, he was found to have enlightenment, understanding, and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods. Your father, Nebuchadnezzar, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and diviners because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king called Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation." So here is a woman, an older woman. As I said, most people, most commentators consider that she was probably one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters. I mean, he had lots of wives to have daughters from. So uh, 
and she had, been a, she had witnessed some of the things. She knew about this. Again, Belshazzar would have, it was, uh, would have been a, uh, two generations removed from Nebuchadnezzar, his grandchild. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. And the king said to Daniel, So, you are Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? Okay, you're, you are a captive. You know, he's just reminding, you know, you know, a little bit of Daniel who you are. You know, I'm the, I'm the king. You know, you're one of the guys that my dad took as a slave. Okay, right? So you get the picture of what's going on here. I have heard that a spirit of the gods is in you, and that enlightenment, understanding, and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and tell me its interpretation, but they were not able to give the interpretations of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now, if you are able to read the writing and tell me its interpretation, you shall be clothed in purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and rank third in the kingdom." Just as an aside, that whole thing of rank third in the kingdom was a total puzzle to most scholars for, for, for generations and generations until archaeology discovered the fact that Belshazzar was himself just second in the kingdom. So if he was going to give somebody an honor, it had to be third. It took him a long time to figure out the Bible was accurate in this little detail. They couldn't understand it. Verse 17, then Daniel answered in the presence of the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Oh, <laughs> he's kind of, you know, like, you know, I, okay, I'm here, you called me, you know, I've got to come, but hey, I don't, want your, I don't want your chain of gold, I don't want the purple, I don't want to be called third in the kingdom. You know, so he, you, you, he, he's, he's, pushing, he's pushing back a little bit. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and let him know the interpretation. Verse 18, O king, the most high God gave your father, Nebuchadnezzar, kingship, greatness, glory, and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. He killed those he wanted to kill, kept alive those he wanted to keep alive honored those he wanted to honor, and degraded those he wanted to degrade. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he acted proudly, he was deposed from his kingly throne and his glory was stripped from him. He was driven from human society and his mind was made like that of an animal. His dwelling was with the wild asses, the donkeys. He was fed grass like oxen and his body was bathed with the dew of heaven until he learned that the most high God has sovereignty over the kingdom of mortals and sets over it whomever he will. Verse 22, and you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. You know, it's hard to, you know, he would have been raised, he would have heard all the stories. You have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. The vessels of his temple have you brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have been drinking wine from them. You have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose power is your very breath, and to whom belong all your ways you have not honored." So from his presence, the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed. Many, many, tekel, and parson. And some translations, uparson, which u is just Aramaic or Hebrew for and, and parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Many, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Paris, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed in purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made concerning him that he should rank third in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. 
Darius, what he had done is they had changed the course of a river that flowed there in Babylon. And so that uh, when they, he had diverted the river to a different, they dug a different uh, channel and they diverted the river in the middle of the night. And then he sent his, his forces under the gate that led into the city because that's how they had their water. And so they were able to divert the channel and then just march right into the city. Just, I mean, otherwise Babylon was practically impregnable. It had enormously high walls, extremely thick. It would have taken years of siege to try to get in. Darius outsmarted them. And that night, Belshazzar died. You know, it's interesting. Many can mean, as we read, as Daniel gave the interpretation numbered. Can also, and interesting part, perhaps part of the reason why some of the, there are a couple meanings to this. It wasn't just quite simple. Many can also mean mina, which was a unit of money. Tekel, besides being meaning weighed, can mean shekel, which was also a unit of money. Later on became coins, okay? Originally you weighed money. Parson, the, he, Daniel was using the singular Paris, which means divided, or Persia, or can mean half a mina or half a shekel. So it's divided. So instead of having a full shekel or a full mina, you divide it. You had less of it all of a sudden. Why is this interesting? Why is this interesting? This week, I got back. In fact, it was this Thursday. I got a financial newsletter from a, a financial analyst named Porter Stansberry. He's been around a long time, and he was writing his financial newsletter of October 15th, 2009. He's writing some rather astonishing things. Porter Stansberry sees the U.S. Federal Reserve action of assuming all the liability of the various investment banks and the unprecedented deficit spending of the United States government as being, and I'm using his words, quote unquote, the end of America. Because of these U.S. fiscal policies, just going nuts financially, sort of like a Babylonian drunken orgy in a different way, it will eventually result in a massive devaluation of the U.S. dollar and the end of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. This is what he's predicting very clearly, and he's not the only one. I just happened to use him. Porter Stansbury makes the point, he says that since the beginning of the financial crisis last year, the U.S. federal government has lent, spent, guaranteed, in one year, $11.6 trillion. Including being the backstop of the entire U.S. mortgage system. The U.S. has been massively increasing its money supply and credit to do this. They've been essentially creating it just on the ledger, adding zeros. <laughs> adding, adding zeros. <laughs> Doubling it in a year, the credit and money supply. Stansbury says that inevitably this will result in inflation. Nothing, he notes, in our financial markets is prepared for this kind of high inflation that is coming down the pike. The value of bonds, corporate, federal, will crash. The cost of borrowing will skyrocket. I remember when it forced me out of one career and into doing something else back in 1981, when interest rates for a new house were 19%, or a used house, 19% interest rate on your mortgage. I was a real estate agent down in L.A. at the time. It just, the market just died. You couldn't, <laughs> you, you can't do business with 19% but nobody was loaning money unless you were going to pay them 19%. My sales just dried up. The offices were closing. <laughs> I mean, just, it, was, it, was, it was terrible. American people were desperate. They elected Ronald Reagan to get rid of Jimmy Carter. <laughs> it was a terrible, terrible time. People forget how what, some of these things. It's been a few years. Consider these numbers. Stanbury says, right now, without counting any of the unfunded liabilities of our government, which are very real obligations, by the way, such as Social Security and Medicare and things like this, our national debt is $12 trillion. There are roughly 100 million American households. So that's a national debt of roughly $120,000 per family. That's more than the average American owes on his mortgage. So besides whatever mortgage they have on their house, they owe... That again, $120,000.
per household. He says that, think about this in terms of interest payments. Even with the interest rates at all-time lows around the world, the U.S. will spend almost $400 billion on interest payments to service this existing national debt. That's at a 3.3% interest rate. Now, what does that mean? What percentage does this mean? Currently, the U.S. takes in roughly $2 trillion a year in taxes. $2 trillion a year in taxes. Half of which comes from income taxes, so $1 trillion. So the interest on the debt at 3.3% is already consuming 20% of all tax receipts, 20% of all tax receipts, or 40% of all income taxes. 40% just to pay interest on the debt at 3.3%. What if it goes up to 6%? What if it goes up to 9%? For years, in the late 70s and early 80s, I thought 9 and 10% was great money. I could, do business, I could figure out a way to do business at 9 or 10%, but not at 19. What if it goes up to 19%? How much of all taxes would it take? Do you follow the math? I mean, there's, the money isn't there. It seems obvious to me that the money, says Stansbury, will never be repaid, could never be repaid. The only real question is how much of a haircut, quote unquote, he's saying, our creditors are willing to accept in terms of the loss of purchasing power of the US dollar. So far, inflation remains relatively benign. Our creditors don't seem to be losing very much. But we know this will change and could change rapidly as the Fed continues to expand its balance sheet with less and less creditworthy assets. At what point will our creditors finally decide they can't finance any more of our deficit spending because we're simply not worth the risk? No one in Washington realizes you can't borrow money endlessly. It's like they're at a party with Belshazzar drinking and carrying on, and the party is on, and the party is on, till their handwriting comes on the wall, many, many tekel ufarsin. Let's go to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28, I want you to see something. Deuteronomy 28. And verse 43, I'm breaking into this. this, is a rather interesting chapter all to its own. You might read the whole chapter, but I'm not going to do that today. I'm just going to give a short version. This is essentially the latter part of a, of a couple chapters called the Blessings and Cursings. They're blessings for a nation that humbles itself before the Lord God of creation. And then you get a chapter of that there are curses for that generation and that nation that proudly stiffs it to God and their pride and arrogance. In verse, verse, 40, uh, verse 43, it says this. Aliens residing among you shall ascend above you higher and higher, while you shall descend lower and lower. They shall lend to you, but you shall not lend to them, and they shall be the head, and you shall be the tail. All these curses shall come upon you, pursuing and overtaking you until you were destroyed because you did not obey the Lord your God by observing the commandments and the decrees that he commanded you. They shall be among you and your descendants as a sign and a portent forever. Verse 47, because you did not serve the Lord your God joyfully and with gladness of heart for the abundance of everything. And in North America, haven't we had the abundance of everything? We have. You don't have to spend much time on television. You get on some of the reality programs, some of the, the factual programming, showing you the conditions around the world from Africa and all these thousands of people trying to escape into Europe from, from absolute abject poverty. crammed together in these Chinese cities where they sleep in, you know, what we would say is a locker. You know, they, people sleep in, you know, space about the same size as we stuff all our stuff in here. 
That's a room. Because you did not serve the Lord your God joyfully and with gladness of heart for the abundance of everything. Therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and lack of everything. And he will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. Wow, that is something else. I think we're seeing these things. I think Porter Stanberry is, you know, he's not making these things up. When I was, you know, if, if, I, if we went back to when I was a teenager, the United States was uh, riding, it was, it was top of the world. We were the leading nation of the world. Life was pretty good. We had an abundance of everything. And during those years, you know, there was even a form of religion that was pretty widely practiced in the United States. But, you know, whether it's the United States or whether it's Canada, we have been wandering farther and farther away from God. And we've been doing, in, in the United States, they've been doing just insane stuff recently. I mean, it's, it is like Belshazzar's party. Will that affect us here on Vancouver Island? Will that affect us in Canada? Will that affect you, wherever you are, who are watching me on the Internet? You bet it's going to affect you. I don't know how dramatically or how remarkably, but for Canada, it will be devastating if our neighbors to the south, when they finally reap the whirlwind, and they are going to reap the whirlwind. Stanberry is giving them maybe a 10-year period of time at the outside for it to finally come to roost. I mean, that's his guess. He says his guess. He says it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And everything is going to change. Everything is going to change. You know, we just finished coming out of the Feast of Tabernacles where we're picturing the world ahead, the world tomorrow. A world where the government will be run by those who are leading with the Spirit of God. Where there will be justice, where there will be righteousness, where there will be peace. It's going to make a big difference. But that's not the world we live in right now. You know, the, the good things that we've had, that I've lived with, because I was born, you know, some seven years after the close of World War II, that I've experienced almost all of my life. You know, there have been some bad recessions here and there. And I, you know, there are a couple times in my life I've gone hungry. But nothing like what's coming. Nothing like what's coming. But right now, the times are good. When I sit down at the table and I pray, I thank God for allowing me to serve him in abundance and freedom and with peace. It's on my mind. It has been on my mind for a while. Let's go, let's go to Matthew. Matthew 11. You know, we heard about from Eric, Mr. Jansen, during the feast, we were having a, are you too busy? Are, you know, are you, are, you, are, you being, are you too busy? Are you being under Satan's yoke? God said for those who were going to stiff it to him, who were going to be proud, who would refuse to humble them, he was going to put a yoke of iron on their neck. Now, a yoke is a concept that is a little different for us living here at the beginning of the 21st century. We don't really know too much about yokes unless you've spent a little time going to museums or some of these things. It used to be they would yoke oxen or they would, uh, and generally it was you're, you're yoking oxen. Oxen are large animals. They were used to power things. They didn't have cars in the old days. You know, they had animal power. And oxen could pull far more than horses. Okay, so they used them the old days when they came out from the east coast of, of, of North America and they came by wagon west, they used oxen mostly because oxen could continue to pull and you could walk beside them. You didn't ride in the thing that you had all your goods in. You walked. And the oxen walked about the same speed as you could walk. And they were great. And you could eat them besides. You know, they were tastier than horses. And they were stronger. And they, you know, they would do a lot of work, but they would yoke them together with these big, you know, they have this big wood thing, and there'd be two, two wooden um, ewes that'd come through, and they'd yoke a pair of animals, and they would go forward. 
you yoke someone to put them under work. In the ancient Middle East, you would yoke human beings to put them as slaves, to drag, you know, stones and stuff if you were a prisoner of war and you were living, you know, just, you know, you had a rag or two that you wrapped around your, your loins and it gave you enough food to keep you going and, they'd, you know, they'd yoke you together and you'd haul stuff. That's what, that's what your fate was if you were a captured prisoner of war during those times. An iron yoke that God was saying there in Deuteronomy uh, and the curses chapter is talking you know, is, is a yoke you can't break very easily. It's tough. It's on there. And it's hard. And it's heavy. But Jesus said this in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. As opposed to this yoke of iron, what does he say? Matthew 11 and verse 28. And I'm reading here out of the NIV. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. To be a Christian does not mean you do not have a yoke. We do. But Christ is saying his yoke is easy and it's light. Why does he yoke us? Who is he yoking us to? Now, that's an interesting thought, isn't it? You know, he's hitching you up with God himself. He's hitching you up with the brethren. He's hitching you up with the church. He's hitching us up because he's got stuff for us to do. <laughs> We're not sitting here just, you know, you know, contemplating our navel and twiddling our thumbs. He's hitching us up because he says, you know, I have something for you to do, but come to me if you're weary and you're burdened. I'm going to give you rest. Learn about me. You know, I'm humble as opposed to somebody like Belshazzar who is proud and lifted up. And you can find rest. Rest for your souls with me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But still, it is a yoke. And there is a burden to being a Christian if you want to put it that way. What is, you know, what's the burden to inherit the universe and to live forever? I don't know. But it does sometimes, it can seem like a burden. If you've been a Christian long enough, there have been those times you'll find, yeah, it'll be a, you know, I really, you know, maybe I don't want to do this, but, I, but this, is my, this is what I'm called to do. And I need to do it. Let's go to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. See, one of the problems that we have with the most common form of Christianity today is people think that, you know, they don't, you know, there's nothing, you know, they, they do as they please, you know. I don't have to, there's nothing, I'm not required to do anything, you know, it's all these things. Do as I please, whatever. God doesn't have any call on me. He doesn't have any call on my time, my effort, my wealth, or anything else. Is that the way it is? Is that really what Christ was teaching? Uh, verse 20, uh, chapter 25 of Matthew and verse 14. I'll read here from the NRSV. <clears throat> For it is as if, and I'm breaking in, of course, to a chapter, talking about what the kingdom of heaven, what the kingdom of God is going to be like or the judgment of the kingdom of God. Christ, and this is what Christ is saying. He said, For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves. Okay, slaves are generally, you know, in the ancient world were yoked. <laughs> okay, symbolically, if not physically, actually. And if it was a good master, it was only symbolically. And entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, a fairly substantial amount of money. To another, two, a little bit less. And to another, one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. He produced with what he had and was given. He produced. He didn't just sit there, twill his thumbs and said, hey, all I have to do is show up in church. <laughs> and warm a seat. He expects them to go out and trade with what he's given and make more. Do something with it. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two talents more. 
But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. And after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. You gave me these resources, spiritual, physical, financial, whatever it is, everything we have. And I like the word talents because, you know, for us, we don't think of talents so much as money these days as we think of what we're given, what we have, right? Isn't that what we think of as talents, you know? I can dribble a basketball. <laughs> Not that I can, okay? I can dribble a basketball, but I mean, you know what I mean. Or I can play a violin, okay? I know how to frame a house, okay? I can patch people up. I'm a good medic. I can make a great movie and documentary, whatever it might be. I can garden. I can cut bait and fish. <laughs> whatever it might be. Master, you have handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. And in this life, we just have a few things in comparison to God. A few things. And I will put you in charge of many things because you've been trustworthy and you have taken advantage of the talents I gave you and you did more with them. You produced Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. He didn't give him, Hey, you, why didn't you make me five like this other, like, like Joe? Joe made me five. Okay? I better use myself. I could say, you know, yeah, if somebody else made only two. <laughs> You know, why didn't you make me five? No, he didn't say that. He didn't say, you didn't, you're not as good as Joe because you only made two. He gave you two talents to begin with. You made two. You did the same amount of good. You knew where you started from and where you came from. And he appreciated that. And what does he say? Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things enter into the joy of your master because you showed you had the character to do with, to, you know, to produce for the master. Doesn't matter what you started with. You're in, you go with a little, whether it's two or five, it's still a little compared to God, but you're entering into many things and the joy of the master. Then the one who received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you were a harsh man. Reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. And here, have what's yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I could have received what was my own with interest. Hopefully, you wouldn't have invested them in U.S. dollars. <laughs> so take the talent from him and give it to the other one with ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have in abundance. But from those who have nothing, even that which they have will be taken away. They'll lose everything. They'll lose everything. For as this worthless slave, as for this worthless slave, Throw them into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So here's someone who had a chance to know the master. He was his slave. He was yoked by him. He received a talent, but he had this attitude. You know, I don't want to do, you know, I, the masters called him lazy because he didn't do anything with it. Where he is fearful. He allowed his fear to get the better of him. And he, what was the end result? It was not that he was going to get even less things, but he was, he was, he was going to have nothing. Nothing. So it's a, it, it is the parable of the talents really is, is a wake-up call to all of us.
You know, in the Church of God International, of which we here in the Church of God in Nanaimo Congregation are part of, we've adopted, and this is not news, we, you know, we have the volunteer model for doing God's work, church's work. You know, it's no longer you have a professional paid ministry that is supposed to do everything and, and everybody else just pays and prays. It doesn't work that way anymore. It's a, we've adopted a completely different model to get things done. And really, the master expects us to do with what we are given. You have to say, how can I grow this next year? How can I help this next year? What can I do to put the church forward? Because truly, it's not going to go on the way it is forever. I can, it's not. The handwriting is on the wall, brethren. And everyone out there in internet land, you know if you pick up you, you know, your financial newspapers, it's written out there for anyone who has eyes to see. So finally, someday it says the emperor has no clothes. And all of a sudden, the United States currency becomes worthless. And pandemonium ensue, ensue, you know, ensues you know, the next 15 minutes. No, the place just goes nuts. Who knows how long we really have. Porter Stansbury does. No, I don't know. I'm not setting any dates. But we do have something we should be doing in the meantime. And there are many jobs to be filled. You know, I am busy. Hopefully I'm not under Satan's yoke. You know, but I have to keep in mind, you know, what my priorities are. I know I know I must do more. I must do a lot more. I have some goals, some things that I'm setting and I'm thinking about. I'm trying to say, okay, how can I improve my ministry? How can I improve this reaching out here in this local area, in this community, and doing more? And I'm thinking about what I need to do and how in the world I'm going to try to fit it in and do it all. One thing's for certain. We've reached, we've, we've, we've gone up here in Nanaimo. We've gone up from where we were. We've made considerable progress. We're at a certain plateau now. But as you know, anybody who's done any hiking knows that after you get to a certain level, you know, you walk along, and it continues to go up because we're not at the end. The mountain is over there. We have to go higher. We've got more we need to do. I had an email from James Ludvigson over in Penticton. Hello, everybody in Penticton, if you're watching this. And he says, well, you know, he's not content with just seven or eight people meeting older people seven or eight older people, meeting together there in Penticton. <clears throat> we have work to do. And he's asking questions. You know, how can we do this? How can, how can we get, you know, get the ball rolling more and do more with it? He's been ordained a deacon, and it's good he's thinking that. It's excellent that he's thinking that. And the brethren, it was wonderful to see the brethren from Penticton. They were, it was great to see them. Really appreciated that. Well, here in Nanaimo, what do we need? Well, I know what we need. You know, if we're obviously, if we're going to do more with our services and things, we need more participation. We need a choir. We need music. We need more people praying. <laughs> I had a real hard time sometimes the feast finding people to pray. <laughs> you know, I shouldn't. <laughs> Should I? We need, you know, like we have a new sound system. It's a sophisticated sound system, but we need someone who will take charge. Actually, you know, set it up. It takes a certain amount of time. You know, setting up, I appreciate those who are serving in this. You know, for me to come in and set up a light and set up this and, and put up our tripod and camera and get the internet going, it takes a certain amount of time. You have to bring all, like, all this stuff and set it up and then get it working and then take it down and it's work. But it's just like, you know, the, the priests and the Levites in the temple, it's acceptable. This is the acceptable sort of thing to do on the Sabbath. This is the sort of acceptable thing that it is to do on the Sabbath. We need a choir. We need music. We need more people praying. We need, a sound separate, a sound, we need to get our sound system up. And Josh can't be here every week. You know, he's, yeah, I, and we want, you know, we have we, an outline church services in the Vancouver area. We have people over there now. This is an area with millions of people. Eric and I are, you know, Western Canada. We have British Columbia and Alberta to think about. 
a little help from friends, right? Hey, if our prime minister can get in front and play the piano and say a little help with our friends, we need a little help with our friends too. We do, to make things happen. How about youth, young adult activities for this coming year? We're going to have a ski trip. We're going to do some things. We're going to have activities to, to have opportunities, not just for the activity to do something for doing something. It's not like the old YOU, let's just keep the kids busy. But all these things have context and opportunities to talk about things that are important, things in this book, the spiritual things, and the stresses and the problems that we're facing every day to keep faith. This is what we need the opportunities for. Looking for those times to build those relationships with individuals, to show that we've got stuff moving on. I can't do all this. Eric can't do all this. We need people to step up to the plate. To say, I've got some talents. Let's exercise them. Let's do something. Let's do more. You know, all these things. I know we need to advertise. Jerry was mentioning it. It was very true. We need to advertise. Weekly. <laughs> we're here. You know, don't, you know, we're not hiding off. We're not hiding. We're here. Come. Sometimes it takes a year before people respond to advertising and say, you know, these people are still here. They're nutty, they're crazy, but you know, they're still there. They've got to have something going on. And then I can tune in the internet and I see that they're not rolling the aisle and frothing at the mouth. You know, they sound, you know, they actually are making some sense. But how do we point them to the internet? How do we get them to tune in? Well, we have to advertise. We have to raise the flag and let them know, yeah, we're here. You know, we're still sitting in Fort Dodge. They haven't chased us out yet. Okay. So we have, are you too busy to help? Are you too tired at the end of the day because you're working, you know, you know, 80 hours and, you know, three jobs that you can't, don't have any time to help do the church's work? We are on a volunteer model. We need everyone. There's no one who isn't given a talent. At least one and if you're given one talent, the master expects you to do something with it, doesn't he? He does. It may be praying. Pray with more, you know, longer, harder, better, more, more however it might be, thoughtfully. If it's playing violin, you know, get that appreciate a little more smoothly. <laughs> whatever it might be. If you're paying uh, ties, you know, bigger checks. <laughs> Whatever it might be, whatever your talents are. See, I'm not, God doesn't say, you know, you have to do this, this, and that. No, he said, you have to examine yourself. What is he giving you? What are your, what can you do? You have to, this is self-reflection. This is enthusiasm. Your reward is going to depend upon your level of enthusiasm and involvement in the church. <laughs> or not. You could lose everything because the one who he was yoked by the mass, he was there, he was given, and he didn't do, and he lost everything in the weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a lesson, it's a, it's a lesson that we always need to think about. Let's go to Acts 9. Acts 9. I always find this particular scripture, I always remember this immediately takes me back to the time that I lived in Jerusalem for the time because there was a bus stop that if you wanted to meet people, it was right down downtown, and if you wanted to meet people in downtown and you wanted to go do some shopping or go out and see some stuff, you'd say, meet me at Tabitha Kumi, which is actually taken right out of here uh, of Acts, which I think is, is kind of interesting. It was a bus stop right on you know, one of the major lines, and it's taken right here out of Acts 9. Acts 9, and let's go to verse 36. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas, means gazelle. Okay, that's what, both in Greek and in Aramaic. She was devoted to good works. She was devoted to good works, Tabitha was. And acts of charity. At that time, she became ill, and died. Bad things happen to good people. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda is, was near Joppa, 
The disciples who had heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs and all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. She clothed them. She had, she had this talent. She had the skill of working with cloth to clothe people. And in the ancient world, you couldn't just go down to Sally Ann and pick something up for 50 cents. <laughs> it didn't work that way. You know, it was, it was a lot of effort to make garments in those days. A lot of effort. It was handwork. Dorcas had made for them while she was with them, and Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, kumi! Tabitha, get up! And she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then called the saints and widows and showed her to be alive. And this became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. So it was amazing. Tabitha Kumi, Tabitha, get up. And because of that, because she had those good works, God was willing to do this miracle. And of course, it, you know, all these people, it just spread. It was word of mouth advertising the best form if possible to get the church to grow combination of a variety of things. People who knew they had, you know, Tabitha doing what she needed to do, the brethren doing what they needed to do, Peter doing what he needed to do too. And God, of course, adding the increase in making it all productive. Let's go to Ephesians 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Epistle of Paul. Ephesians 2.10. I'm going to read this one out of the Amplified Version. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. This is the Amplified Version. Paul says this. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, created, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we might do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them, living that good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. That we may do those good works which God predestined for us. God predestined us to do good works. And Titus, in the book of Titus. Another epistle of Paul. People say that... Uh, you know, here's Paul talking about that we should be doing good works. Oh, okay. Titus 3, verse 1. Titus, Paul says this to Titus, who was, in the, who was an elder. Remind them to be subject to rulers. This is remind the brethren and authorities be, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, to show every courtesy to everyone, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions, you know, yoked with a yoke of iron, and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, despicable, hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of any works or righteousness that we had done. No, we can't. We can't buy our way out of what we've done. God is gracious and, and forgives us for what we've done in the past. But according to his mercy, through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, this spirit he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Heirs. The hope of eternal life. The saying is sure. I desire that you insist on these things so that those who have come to believe in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable to everyone. To everyone. Paul says, I want you, Titus, to insist on these teachings. 
so that all will trust in God and that they will devote themselves to doing good, doing those good works. He really, he does. Let's go to James. One more here, James. The Apostle James, right after Hebrews. And I'll, I'll read this one in the Amplified Version. So it's James chapter 2. James chapter 2 and verse 17. James 2 and verse 17. So by faith, James writes, if it does not have works, so also faith, excuse me, so also faith. If it does not have works, deeds, and actions of obedience to back it up, by itself is destitute of power. It's inoperative. It's dead. Verse 18. But someone will say to you then, you, you say you have faith and that I have good works. Now, you show me your alleged faith apart from any good works, if you can, and I, by good works of obedience, will show you my faith. You believe that God is one. Okay, you believe this doctrine that God is one. You believe this theological position <coughs> that God is one. Well, that's good. So do the demons. And they shudder in terror and horror because, of course, they're not obeying God and they're not doing good works. Let's go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, chapter 2. 1 Peter 2, in verse 1. And, okay, and I think I have this one in the new uh, King James Version. Yeah, I think that's what I have it in here. 1 Peter Chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, so that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, that his yoke is light, and he gives peace. Verse 4, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, and God is rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 6, therefore it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes in him will by no means be put to shame. Now you can make those five talents. You can make those two talents. You can make even that extra one talent. You will not be put to shame if you trust in God, if you trust that Jesus Christ will empower you and motivate you, inspire you and guide you. Put your hand with his. If you're not too busy, if you're not too busy. Verse 7, therefore to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, and he's quoting, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief's cornerstone. Uh-oh. <laughs> Darius the Mede is coming under the gate. <laughs> you're going to get it, Belshazzar. You can party hardy and you're getting it tonight. Verse 8, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, they stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were also pointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg of you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. Yeah, don't drink all your wine out of the holy vessels. Carrying on. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, among the nations, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. You know, we will, if we're going to prove ourselves to be disciples, worthy slaves of Jesus Christ, it's because we're going to love each other and we're going to love God and we're going to put ourselves out and we're not going to be too busy 
to do this and to exercise and to grow our talents. Brethren, let's have a, um, this next six months, we've got a lot to do. We've got a lot to grow. We've got a, a lot to accomplish. Let's think about this seriously and figure out where we're going to go and what we can do additionally, the things how we can make those talents and grow them because the handwriting is on the wall. Let's not be found wanting.